Hey, everybody, welcome aboard. Uh, something a little different now in, uh, in these quarantine troubling times. Uh, Gianni and myself, we're normally doing Facebook Live, trying to social distance, and now we're doing it uh, from a great distance, each other's homes. And uh, <laughs> joining us right now is, uh, as I've said many times, in my humble opinion, the best indoor soccer goalie I have ever seen, and I'm an old man, uh, William Vanzella. Welcome aboard, buddy. Hey everyone! Thanks, thanks for having me. And uh, oh, don't, speak, don't speak so high of me, because that's not what you think. Well, William, <laughs> it is what I think. I've told Gianni that in in private. I do. Uh, I think you're a tremendous uh, goalie. I think that uh, all the years I've watched this game play out, and you know this as well as any. You don't need to be uh, a world class player to understand world class talent. Um, and when I see guys like yourselves or guys like yourself and, and Vinny and, 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 and some of the other guys, I mean, you're clearly above the best. And that just says what it says. It's not hyperbole. It's not me trying to stroke anybody's ego. It's the truth, and that's how I feel. I appreciate that. I, I really try my best, obviously, like everybody else, but uh, I put my heart in front of everything else, so that might be the difference. Yeah, that, and I think that you're half crazy, like every great goalie <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret. If you, you can be a good goalie and not be crazy. Uh, people <laughs> will understand that, but that's okay. That's very true, though. You're right. Goalies understand it, though. <laughs> yeah, we do. William, um, you know, you grew up in Brazil. What part of Brazil did you grow up in? It's south. South of Brazil. The, <laughs> my, my hometown is, uh, is called Cascavel. Cascavel? Yes. I said that right. I don't want you to get mad at me. When I say things wrong, you get mad. You did, you did, you passed the test. <laughs> William, how old were you when you when that ball first touched your foot or your hands? Probably when I was born. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, on my uh on my door at the hospital, my grandfather already had uh, a little soccer cleats over there. So it's, you know, it is true. I have it I have until now. It's a black and white. I have it. Really? It was, yeah, I was in front of my door. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, soccer for us in Brazil is religion. It's not in the U.S. You have multiple sports and options. Yeah. Uh, most of them are eye-hand coordination, and in Brazil, you only have a soccer. So once you're born, that's they give you a soccer ball, and you better play soccer. You know, uh, William, as my um, love for the game started as a young guy, and granted, I mean, you're from an entire country that worships the sport. I was from a neighborhood that did East Baltimore really was the really the only Mecca of soccer, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago. And so when I was brought into the game, the only thing I knew were the players around me. Um, we didn't have legends in America. There were like two guys we had heard of. One was Kyle wrote and uh, the other was Shep messing. And uh, that was it. We didn't have soccer heroes and, 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 I'm wondering for you, as uh, when you were a kid, all the way until now, does that love of the game ever leave your core? No, I, I would say no. You know, you're born with that love and you start watching games with your family. It's like, you know, you guys all get together for a, a Super Bowl here. And yeah. that, that atmosphere, we can relate it to that. But yeah. again, you have different sports here. In Brazil, you only think about soccer. So it's all year round, you know, teams are playing competitions that you watch your soccer teams, you go to the stadium and all of that. So uh, I don't think I ever lost that. I did lose a little bit the beauty of the game when you just go outside and play with no responsibility, you know, yeah. maybe kick around with your friends. Yeah, I started to play in a high level when I was 13. I left my house to go to an academy. Uh, I live far away from my house, like five hours away from my house when I was an age 13, living under the dorms. Wow. And we're having more soccer than school. Um, not saying that's right, you know, but for the soccer system in Brazil, that's a very profitous system. It yeah. works, you know, I was, yeah. training, I was training in the morning, two and a half, three hours, and I was training in the afternoon, another two and a half hours. And I was going to school 7 to 11.45 midnight. And then you have to do homework. So obviously soccer became a job. Very young stage for me. And that's how I started to provide for my family. And I've been providing for them since I was 14. So if you think about it, I don't have that 
you know, much of that freedom to just play for fun. Yeah. yeah. And that was always a job. So people were still thinking, oh, why is he screaming? Why is he, you know, crazy like that? Uh, that's the job I've been taking and treating myself as a championship game every day kind of mentality to to be where I am. So I, I lost that beauty of, you know, let's go kick around, but soccer is in my blood. You know, William, you're talking about you're talking about how you uh, how you are back in the goal with, you know, demonstrative, how excited you get. You know, when I was a kid, my dad was our coach and he always said the goalkeeper sees the entire field. So the goalkeeper is in charge. He's the he's he's the one that sees the entire field. When you went to these academies and stuff, were you always a goalie or did something just click one day and said, hey, man, like I can I want to I want to switch up. Were you a field player? Were you always a goalkeeper? Uh, in Brazil, actually, it's a fight to not be a goalie. Here, if you try, oh, who's a goalie? Everybody wants to be a goalie. And again, it comes back on the eye-hand coordination. Every sport's here, since you have a kid, you throw in a baseball ball. Soccer, uh, soccer ball is not there. You know, it's American football ball, baseball, basketball, lacrosse. It's all here. And yeah. it was only soccer. So kids actually are not good to block anything. Uh, one day, I was eight. And our keeper could make it to the game. And my coach said, we need a volunteer. And kind of like, okay, I'll do it. Uh, and apparently I did really well. So my coach, you know, said, you definitely need to be a goalie because you have, God gave you a talent. We just need to develop. And I started to take it, you know, serious. And then when I was 13, uh, actually, it's a little longer story. But, you know, I, I try out for the team and, and I made it. So that's how everything started. William, how old were you when you made the transition from the outdoor game to the indoor game? How, how old were you? Probably, you know, in Brazil, you grow up playing indoor, which is futsal, you know. Futsal, right. Yeah, it's very close. So I start playing that and, and playing outdoor when I was 10. Uh, yeah. Then I play outdoor until probably 23 Wow. And then I came back to play indoor after I had two ACL surgeries. So I decided to quit outdoor soccer. And when and you uh, when you came to the uh, indoor game, you were not official. You were not uh, trying. You didn't try out for the blast at first, did you? No, it's, it's kind of like a weird uh, situation to explain. But long story short, I had a friend playing in Syracuse and I was playing in Italy. He showed me the indoor game because I never saw it before. And he invited me to come over to just visit. So I was with him and the keeper on that time playing for Syracuse broke his arm. So they only had one keeper training, which was a queen. Uh, so then uh, my friend told me to train. So I trained with them for like three, three to four days. And they were supposed to go back there. And then my same friend, his name is Andre. He saw that the blast uh, had lose Sagu because Sagu decided to leave in Akira. So when both keepers left, he said, look, I think you should try to go to that team because it's a, it's a great franchise and, and, and such. So that's how everything started. And then DK saw me playing for the U Italian national team in the World Cup of 7v7 2011. And he liked the, the, the games. And then we started a conversation. I think, I think what helped you, too, was your foot skills. Because not a lot of indoor guys have the foot, as a goalkeeper, have the same foot skills as you do. I think, you know, yeah. I tried things before I even got involved with the blast, you know, because of the games, that was the first thing I noticed about you was like, you know, this guy's got, he's got some nice foot skills that you just don't see, you know, that, you know, probably since like the eighties, Mickey, like the slow boat LES yeah. guys, guys like that, who, sure. you know, would use, use their feet a lot. And William has, you know, that's one of his main, main things that he can do really, really well for, uh, for the blast. Yeah. If, if you're a keeper and you can, do well with your feet. It helps a lot, especially, you know, when you're under pressure. Um, I believe every keeper can make save. You know, the difference between keepers is the keepers that make saves at the right moment, uh, especially when you need it most, and those that don't panic in a hard situation because you're always under pressure. Uh, and William, I, I really try. I would imagine that, like you said, growing up uh, in Brazil, it's a fight to be a goalie. Nobody wants to be a goalie, you know. Yeah. So. You're, you're, you're developing your foot skills first. And so that, that side of that game for you is already there. And I've noticed that when I've seen uh, Brazilian goalies in other situations, they always, for o almost always have the foot skills as well. You don't see it as much, say, in the English or European guys because from the time they're seven, 
they know they're going to be 6'5 and 225 pounds. So they just tell them, don't even worry about it. But when you see Brazilians, and I will say even further, a lot of the South American other countries as well, uh, that, that, that skill comes from the, 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 the original way you guys are introduced to the game. Yes, not, not only, you know, futsal really helps, but then the plus, you play pickup game on the street. Mm-hmm. And in the streets, you guys play pickup games in any sports. Like, if, yeah. you're not, if you're not good, you're the last one to get picked, and you hate right. that last pick. <laughs> so you try to really develop, and, and you, know, you know, playing at home, if you've got a soccer ball on your feet and you continue to train. The reality is how many players I've seen, I've played with, that they're not the most skillful players, but they try and they work harder than the others, and they succeed. So you try to get more reps. As a goalie in Brazil, you have to be skillful. Soccer changed a little bit, so keepers are getting more skillful right now. But it's still, you know, Brazil has an advantage. And you see best keepers right now coming from Brazil. Brazil not being in a World Cup, what's that like in your head? I don't think that is in our head. We're still thinking about the day that Germany kicked our butts in the <laughs> Brazilian World Cup really bad. It, it's a it's it's a religion for us, you know. It became my job, but I don't forget that. Yeah, you know, still who are. Your, who was who were your heroes? You know, in your late child, early teens, who were the guys? I mean, I would imagine uh, Ronaldo, Ronaldinho. Were those guys your generation that you looked to like? Wow, they're just amazing. Yeah, so you know, as a goalie, you have to mention. Every kid on my age would say uh, goalkeeper from Brazilian national team, his name is Tafarel. Mm-hmm. So when Brazil won the 94 World Cup here in the U.S. Oh, you know who they beat, by the way, Mickey, in the final? Yeah, yeah Italy. 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 Yeah. So <laughs> he was the keeper and he was saving the PKs and the broadcast mm-hmm. was going nuts saying mm-hmm. his name. So it, obviously you look up for those. So then you go home and you make a save and you start to scream his name. So it became your, you know, yeah. uh, that, that, that would be the one I would say. And uh, as a field player, I would say Ronaldo. Yeah. It's amazing to me because, you know, in America up until, I mean, you know this probably now, but until about 12 years ago, we didn't even, unless the World Cup was on, we never saw these players. You know, the Ronaldos, the Ronaldinhos, the, the, the Van Nistelrooy's. I mean, I could go down the list and you know them all. And it wasn't until the, the English Premier League came to America that we got to see these players we had only heard about. Cristiano Ronaldo, um, Messi. Like, if this was still 12, 13 years ago, we'd know these names, but they wouldn't mean what they mean to us now. Can you tell me a player that's not Brazilian that you, you stand in awe of? Oh. So I played in Italy for seven years. Yeah. Right? So being in Italy and you know, watching soccer in Italy a lot, I would say Totti for oh. me was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know people say that he wasn't the best from, you know, from all time in Italy. Sure. And you can talk Baggio was better than him or not in right. the right. Rossi and all that. But Totti was just phenomenal. So I really enjoy watching play. He could do anything with the ball. When you think of like when you think of Totti, you think of like it's like Luca Toni, it's uh, Del Piero, and I mean the best in my opinion, one of the best goalies around for years was uh, Buffon from Italy. Still, Buffon, and, and, and he still <laughs> plays. The guy's like forty, he's, and he's, he's still 70, playing. He's seventy-five years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I believe he's forty-two, but yeah, he, he, takes, he takes a great care of himself. You yes. know, he's definitely not a party guy. He's a you know think about working every day and take care of his body doesn't have many injuries so that helps and 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 i'll tell you william a lot like you to me buffon uv was his life and and it was his family he talks about that that juventus the his teammates were an extension of him and and he was the leader and he was the captain back there and i can see it on the field these guys look to you. You're telling everybody what to do. And I'd see that with you as well, uh, that you are – that those guys do – it's a family to you, this blast thing. Oh, absolutely. This goes far beyond, you know, everything people can imagine. Number one, uh, not, you know, not dividing the group in a half, but we have a lot of Brazilians. So, sure. 
we've been calling it uh, ourselves like home away from home. We don't have any family here. So, you know, uh, we get together for Christmas. We spend Christmas together. We spend New Year's Eve together. You know, we train daily basis. But then they're your best friends. Uh, yeah. That's not, you know, I don't have any cousins or anybody to really hang out with. And we just connected so well. It's, it's incredible. And it yeah. goes on the field. And then you see it, our best friends or brothers. But we fight all the time. And then you guys, you guys saw this. And I know you guys comment about it. You sure. have to understand it's like a brother. Okay? Of course. So you, guys, you guys fight at home for anything. Who's yeah. going to do the dishes? And that's a fight. And then right. you guys are not even talking to each other. But then if you step out of the house and somebody tried to beat your brother, you step in front of them and you're going to protect your brother. Of course. We are the same way. We yeah. really, really, really get together off the field. We connect. But when we train, you should see our train sessions. They're worse than games. I've been there. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I bet you reason, we push ourselves, we push yeah. each other. And you, yeah. if you train hard, the game became easier. So we yeah. really know. And the funny part about this is that we know each other's capability. So yeah. if you're not on a level that I know you can be, I'm going to go and push you. And yes. you, can, you can all like it. I don't care. But I know where your stands are. And I don't expect anything less. And sure. that's how you build a championship team. So, I've been telling Gianni this for a year. He won't listen to me. He, <laughs> he keeps being mediocre. So obviously, I have to point something that, you know, we talk that sometimes you got to be careful and not cross the line because we have so many kids on the stands and sure. we think about that. But at the end of the day, this is our job and we do the best we can. There's no stupid information out there. When we scream at each other, if something went wrong between your system or, you know, our plan for the game, we yeah. know what we're talking about. It's not random stuff. And it's not one blaming each other. And people sometimes, they think about this. And, you know, I'm going to use me as an example. But how many times we lose a game and then you hear somebody, yeah, but all he does is blame others. Right. But I blame them as much as I blame every other game. And I don't remember those comments when we win the championship. Do you right. ever heard somebody say, oh, William was screaming a lot in Mexico yeah. when we won the championship and blame the players? No, yeah. you don't. We there, do the same thing every day. It's just people don't realize when we do. There's a very famous, and Gianni will love to hear this, a very famous New York Yankee named Reggie Jackson who seemed to rub a lot of players the wrong way at times. And I heard a great quote. I can't remember if it was Bucky Dan or one of them said, did you ever hate Reggie Jackson? And he said, I hated him all the way to four World Series championships. <laughs> and it's the truth. He said he brought out the best in everyone, and you didn't have to like the guy he would never hurt you off the field, never tried to hurt you on the field, but he could get in your butt if you weren't doing what you were supposed to do. That really means that we want to win. That, yeah. that's, that, that's the reality. You know, you see every player trying to get each other accountable in yeah. different ways. You know, like you mentioned, Tony, it's a very calm guy. So he will yes. lead us by example. You know, he's going to sure. point here and there. Adrian, a little high temp, and he's going to scream at you when you go to the bench. you got to get a better shift. Yeah. You know, I'm going to scream in my way in the back. And then you yeah. have Vinny a different way. And then you have Melo, guy that doesn't talk much. And then you go around and you see all that combination really works for us. It's been worked for so many years. But to answer your question, man, this is our family. And we really love each other. So. Yeah. To run with these guys, to fight with them, to, you know, have a hit in the face for them when sure. they're putting all the work there, it's, it's a pleasure. I'll it tell is. you what, William, it's funny. Mickey and I talked a lot this year. Uh, once Lucas Roque came back, he was like the Brazilian whisperer. Like ev <laughs> everything just calmed down. Lucas would be like, calm down. Never, seriously, like, and Lucas, you know, has a fire in him too. But so many times this year – he was really kind of like the peacemaker. You know, we had some dust-ups with Sonora. We had some dust-ups against San Diego. And right in the middle was was Lucas Common. You guys down, the other team down. Lucas was very even keel this year. Lucas and I came together to the Blast 2012. Yeah. And, uh, and he, we were really good friends. And what I can tell you about Lucas, besides the fact that he's calm, he is he has a good temper, you know, so he's more yeah. kind of like, again, you know, you lead by example. But what he adds on the field for us, on my opinion, and I play with a lot of good players, and I'll tell you, Vinny had one of the most, the greatest years, you know, as a striker ever had for the Blast. 
you know, Neto, unforgettable. You can't forget about it. Lucas, to me, is the most complete striker we ever had or I ever played with. Yeah. For yeah. many Lucas, reasons. Lucas it's, has had some of the best goals in Blast history in now, the playoffs. In the playoffs, now, too. And see, you guys talk about the goals. We talk about a player as well, you know. He yeah. knows when to hold the ball. He will, he knows when to possess. He knows when to sub. He knows when the pressure. He knows. He's so complete in all of the aspects that he can do everything pretty well. Yeah. And that was a huge help for us. So that was a relief, you know. When, again, you get a guy like Vinny, all he wants is to go and go against people and score. That's yeah. his mindset. So, and you won't change a guy like Vinny. And you don't and want you, him to change. You shouldn't Please. change him. No, we can't change that. <laughs> but then, again, you need a good balance. And then the next guy that comes, you know, Hawks in a different way, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, but Lucas is a guy that, you know, really comes down in many ways. Not only, and in the locker, he's such a good guy. Everybody likes him too. So, yeah. that was Really happy to have him back. So, William, when, when you, uh, you know, you're so used to playing on different fields, what was your first, when you first stepped foot on the uh, arena at Towson University, what went through your mind as a goalkeeper? My last year, quitting this. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we went to Sonora on our first championship game and I saw the dimensions, I was like, you can't play here. It's too small. Yeah. Uh, then when we saw that, actually, we went to the arena before the field was there, and I was counting the steps from side to side, and I count them all. And I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be insane. Yeah. But you just see the field, um, you know, it's – I will tell you on my side, it's really hard because I have – a lot more saves to make, which is more interesting for me. Yes, yeah. for sure. But also, the only downside I would say is there's two downsides, in my opinion. Number one, I think every team that comes to to Baltimore has a chance to beat the Blast yeah. because of the size of the field. Yeah. And before at the arena in downtown, I don't think that was actually the the game. We kind of knew we would win almost every game, if not. All of them. Yeah. So because the size of the field, you, you have a chance. Now, that doesn't mean they will beat us, but they have a better chance to get a close game because the size. And the second thing that's very unfortunate is obviously the amount of injuries are going to increase because yeah. the field is small. Not only for me, but for everybody. We've been seeing more ACL injuries than ever, and, and it just hurts us on the roster deeper. For the depth of the roster, it hurts us a little bit. But, man, the good size is the fans are so much closer. That is awesome. Like it gets that, loud. It gets really oh. loud in there. No, and, and and you can hear them talking to you. It's like, come on, Willie, you got to do this. Yeah. Please pop this. You know, you yeah. hear them all. That is insane. You know, yeah. people like the arena so much better. And at the end of the day, to be quite honest with you, we play for our fans. If they are happy – we can't complain, you know? Right. And, and you do make the fans happy for sure. Mickey, one time William and I were sitting down talking and, you know, he, like he just said, you know, you hear the fans and stuff, but he doesn't pay attention to anything else. But he told me there's one song in the game that he hears every single time. It What's is that? SpongeBob. SpongeBob. <laughs> he's like, he's in, he's in the middle of the game. All of a sudden you hear, oh, he, he hears it. It's, it was one of the funniest. He told me that story, man. I, I was rolling. I do, I do, I do. Every single time that song's play, I, I hear that song. It's funny because I don't hear anything else, you know. I, I'm very focused at the game, but, you know, that's funny. But, William, you're talking – sorry, Mickey, but you're talking, William, when you were a child in Brazil training. Let's talk about what you do now for the kids in this area. It's right there on your hat. The Born to Fly is, yeah. your, is your huge training. And I can attest, my nephew CJ trained with you, and I would come out and watch CJ – CJ would go for like, he'd be like the first kid. And I'd say to William, all right, how many more you got tonight? He goes, oh, I got five more. And they're like 45-minute sessions to an hour, if I'm not mistaken. No. You're out there, what, four nights, five nights a week. You have, week, you know, camps throughout the summer. I mean, you're all, you have, I know you have the real successful indoor camp on, uh, on Sunday nights during the season. Tell us a little bit about the Born to Fly. Yeah, uh, so there is more a goalkeeper academy that I'm trying to establish here in Baltimore and help the keepers, you know, with a good instruction and, and a good training. Um, not the best, 
I think I know enough to help the kids, uh, and uh, and I'm happy to do it. On top of that, I've you know I coach club here in Baltimore as well, and I coach a college. Um, so you know, kind of my experience helps a lot. But being focused with keepers is something I always liked. You know, to me is that relationship close with keepers and and understand their pain you know it's so easy to blame a keeper and that's how you're gonna do it, and this will never change i don't expect the change you know we will lose a game no matter what happened it yeah. will be my fault and i'll take that i've been trained i've been trained my whole life and i can tell you this johnny you gotta train as a goalie when you you hit a certain level you have to train your brain more than your skills because mentally it's so hard to be a goalie yes. because no matter what you will be blamed so you have to train yourself to accept the blame and blame yourself even more so i go home i watch every game right away every game every single game you're i usually watch up to like two or three in the morning aren't you every game if that's yep. uh, that's very sadly because when we have back-to-backs i need to get some rest if i don't finish watch the game i probably won't go to bed but you know try sorry uh mickey i just, no, no. I just Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask you, because you're, you're hitting on something I find interesting, and there's not a lot of goalies. There's not a lot of times where you get to talk to a goalie about just being a goalie. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're talking about, like, taking that blame, but isn't there a part of you that you love that? You love that pressure of knowing I do. if you let one by you, it can cost everything. Don't you love that? I, I love the responsibility. I can yeah. tell you that. And, and that might be the slightly difference between me and other keepers, if you want to say, you know, a lot of great keepers on the league, and I, I respect them all. But like I said, the good keepers are the ones that make that save on the right time. Yes. And you have to be prepared for that. So I just love, and you heard people say that, I come big in big games. Yeah. You know, and it is true. And I, it's not that I prepare myself more. I think I'm a little more focused than other games. And I try to minimize my mistakes. Yeah. You won't not make mistakes. So of I'm course. trying to minimize those. And I love and the you, pressure. And I think that that is like, I, whenever the argument of uh, Ronaldo or Messi comes up, I always say that I just feel that Cristiano Ronaldo seems to step up at the bigger moments more than Messi. The World Cup, the, 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 those events, even the, the, the Classico, it seems, I, and maybe it's just my opinion because I like him more, but I just feel like that Ronaldo loves that pressure as well. Yeah, that might be, it, it depends on the side that you're looking for, what you're trying to see. Like, I think God gave Messi a talent. And, yes. sure, and that was it. And yes. I think Cristiano Ronaldo make himself yeah. a talent by yes. training, by getting repetitions, going to the gym and all of that. So you got to respect both. And you obviously have one that you like better. Uh, I do have more tennis that like Cristiano Ronaldo personality than Messi. Like yeah. Messi is a quiet guy and Cristiano, you plus, know, more kind of a leader. Plus, don't, don't lie, he's Argentinian. You're not going to love an Argentinian. That's true. <laughs> That's true, but I really like him as a player. I, I really He's do. amazing. Yeah, he's, he's a once-in-a-lifetime William, listen, uh, we're going to wrap up here. We're just going to give you a chance. If you could, you know, you've mentioned the fans a bunch. The season got ended in a very sad and weird way for all of us. Uh, what are you looking forward to next year, and what do you want the fans to know? Oh, well, first of all, I want the fans to know that I'm not speaking as a William Van Zella right now, but one of the team captains and leaders of this team would be – I've been here for seven years, and – you know, we won four championships in five, in seven years. So I lost only two. I lost two finals, one same final. I think this is a very impressive resume. And I've not done this by myself. I got all my teammates to help me to get along and, and to go there. So I just want the fans to know how much we appreciate them to go on the field and see the arena full. And this is something we always look for uh, when the anthem is about to go. You're looking around and you try to see, okay, this is full. Look how many people are coming to watch me perform. I'll give my best. You know, we always do. Win or lose, unfortunately, is part of the game. You're going to win, lose, you know, playing poorly or playing well. We give everything we have every single game. And that's what I think it comes down to. Be a good home model for these kids and see 
set the like good tone for them to grow up and be uh, good people not only you know sports sport wise but good people off the field so looking forward for these fans to come back next year and support us on my opinion i think we fell short this season because we would be a surprise i think people people realize that when we go to playoff we're a different team but they i don't think they really believed on us and we knew we had a surprise for everybody i was waiting for uh, unfortunately i would have loved to have seen it play out that's for sure yeah, I was very curious to see who would avoid the playoffs because they have the chance to pick. Yes. I doubted they would pick us. So I was very look I was looking forward to see who would we face. But again, we can't control these things. We have to be home quarantined. Great. No problem. That's just a game. You know, we have another season. We have another year. People need to be healthy. That's the most important part. I'm really looking forward for next year. Hopefully we can have our team back, all those players back and we can compete for another championship. It won't be easy, but we're going to try. Well, William, thank you so much. And Gianni, anything you want to say in closing? No, man. I mean, I just want to say, uh, you know, last week we did the, uh, we did the, uh, the merchandise sale, and yes. William happened to just text me. He's like, hey, check your phone, and he donated those gloves. People are still talking about the gloves. Yeah. He donated gloves, and we actually sh – uh, Mark shipped them out this week, uh, the, the two winners. I mean, it was – People are still saying that was one of the coolest things. Mello, uh, we're doing another one in May. Mello yeah, messaged yeah. that he's going to uh, auction off some of his shoes. Um, yeah. We actually have some signed game balls that we have in the office. So some other guys now, because of what William did with the gloves, are now going to be stepping up. So it's – and all the stuff – It's it, that was just one of the coolest things that we – you and I had so much fun that night. But for William to do that and just to watch oh, it just oh. take off like crazy. Total class. Unbelievable. Total class. I, I got to say that, guys. So, number one, uh, I'm very lucky to have a sponsorship for gloves. Uh, if you had to provide me gloves, so that's, you know, it's nothing that I really pay for anything. So, I'm going to thank you, Aviata, for the donations because they give me and support me every time. All my gloves going for donations. It's just a different donation here and there. I do baskets for schools or whatever, cancer. I, I, I really donate all my gloves. So to me, it wasn't a problem at all. I was just happy to do it. And I post that another day and people are complimenting me. I have nothing, no business. Like I really felt grateful that people support what we're doing. And is that not on me? This too... It, uh, these two people that I, I didn't want to name anybody because, you know, I don't like that. But whoever came up with that amount of money for my gloves, I really mean, meant so much to me. So I really appreciate the gesture, you know. And I think, William, that's why when guys like yourself do that, the humility that you do it with makes that even more valuable and makes people willing to, to give that way. So that does fall back on you. I understand what you're saying. You don't pay for the glove, but people aren't buying a goalie glove. They can go to Dick's Sporting Goods and doing that. They're buying yours and what you represent. So that's what puts the value on it. And uh, on behalf of me and Gianni, thank you for that. No, uh, thank you guys. Again, I'm just glad to help go in the community. I go to schools to talk, you know, I go to hospital to visit kids. I really help like animals shares and I try to donate my time to kick back to the community. <clears throat> Baltimore is just an amazing city. Great people around here. I'm very happy to be around it and do a little bit that I can to help the community. And we and see it with your, we see it with we see it with your buddy Liam too. Liam Liam and you are yeah. just you wow, know that's great. Just a, one of the tightest relationships you'll ever see. Yeah. Yeah actually Corey messaged me yesterday so she was just oh I'm just checking on you is everything good. They're fantastic. They're just a good family. And see, you know, I met so many good people through uh, community charities and stuff like that. Usually I say that you're trying to find a good people, you're trying to find a good friend, go to a charity event. You're going to yeah. find good people in there. Oh, yeah. so I'm very, I've been very lucky here in Baltimore. Find so many amazing people there on my side. Soft side that I've done with the animals and barks. They're just like the day we had the jersey. That was a cool jersey, by the way. Uh, unbelievable. So very happy to, to help. In the hey, Gianni, I came up with a great promotion for next year with Barks and with William. What we'll do is we'll fire small pets out of a cannon and <laughs> William has to save them before they hit a wall. I'll make sure that I save them all. That you're going to motivate me to do something. Poor, poor animals, man. Come on. 
Guys, thank you so much as always. I love talking to you guys, William. I've been waiting to talk to you all year. And uh, sorry it isn't after a championship series, but uh, what a crazy year. William Banzella, Gianni Tuminello, Mickey Cachella, thank you guys all so much. Really appreciate it. Be safe, thank guys. You guys. Thank you. All right, everybody. We'll see you soon.